Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and uh, today I'm back down in the studio. And we're going to be having the third and final episode on Remington's Army and Navy size revolvers. So if you've seen the first two episodes, you know the first one covered cap and ball revolvers uh, from A to Z for the Army and the Navy. The second episode dealt with cartridge conversions of those guns in the post-Civil War era. And in this episode, what we're going to talk about are the purpose-made cartridge firing guns, uh, all Army models, the Navy went away, except for conversions. They kept selling conversions until about 1890. But uh, the new Army model, the 1875 and later the 1888 and the 1890 are going to be our topics of discussion for today. All right, as I've told you before, the post-war years were tough for Remington. Uh, all of their handgun contracts were canceled by the government, uh, which caused them great financial distress, mainly because they were so heavily leveraged with debt to expand the company during the Civil War that once those contracts disappeared, they still had to service that debt. And they largely turned to the rolling block rifle uh, to be the vehicle of their salvation, which, which largely it was. But they continued in the handgun game uh, through really the entire last quarter of the 19th century. Now, they concentrated quite a bit on turning out pocket, pocket model revolvers, derringers, uh, those were really their biggest sellers. But they never walked away from the Army and Navy size revolvers either. And as we told you in the last episode, they did some cartridge conversions of uh, Civil War type cap and ball Army and Navy revolvers. But in 1874, they turned out their first purpose made Army size revolver, uh, which has come to be known as the Model 1875 Remington. Um, they, they, of course, called it the Remington, the new improved Remington Army revolver. Now, the interesting thing was, people often say that, well, they lost out in the government marketplace to Colt, and that's why they didn't do so well. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think that that was ever really their goal, to compete directly with Colt for U.S. Army contracts, because they never really seriously gave that a try. And they could have, because Smith & Wesson seriously gave it a try uh, after the Colt was originally chosen. Smith & Wesson forced the trials back open, and uh, as a result, the Schofield revolver was chosen as uh, an alternate to the Colt. Both of them were in use at the same time. Remington certainly could have done the same thing, and it's hard to say how they would have fared any worse than the Colt, since they're pretty much a copy of the Colt. So the fact that they didn't leads me to believe that that wasn't the market they were primarily after. And, and I think their primary market, uh, in their own minds, when they developed it, were foreign military sales. Because that's where they were making all their money, on the rolling block rifle. They were selling that in Europe and in Asia and in Africa, and uh, they were selling them hand over fist. And the fact that the matter is, the first major sale, even before they were produced, of Colt's 1875 Remington revolver was to the government of Egypt. And Egypt placed an order for 10,000 of those. And I think that that was Remington's target all along, was to get large foreign military orders. Uh, and I think they were you know, taking a page out of Smith & Wesson's book with their business with Russia. So... That was an auspicious beginning to get that $10,000 order. The problem was that the Egyptians were very unreliable customers, and they were already several hundred thousand dollars in arrears on payments for their rolling block rifles. And Remington decided they had to just cut them off. So it's doubtful that more than a few pistols were ever sent to Egypt on that contract. And Remington had to readjust its market plan and look to the American West, uh, which I do not think was their original plan. But now they had, you know, 10,000 pistols hanging around, and they had to flog those things pretty hard. 
Uh, and, and the fact remains that they failed on the foreign market. The, the only other order they got besides the Egyptian order um, was for the Republic of Mexico. And, you know, I think the problem that they were facing is that even by the 1870s, they were already selling an obsolete technology uh, out on the marketplace because there was a single action, you know, a big single action cartridge firing revolver. And I think those were being supplanted, even in the military sphere, by double-action cartridge-firing revolvers. And certainly the British and the Europeans were hawking those all over the world at that time. And uh, we were still in our single-action phase, by and large, here in America. And, and would remain in that, even though there are some notable exceptions, but for military-sized revolvers would remain that way. Uh, until the 1890s. So, so Remington was not able to generate the overseas sales that they wanted, and they had to look to the major market outside of the military for big bore army sized revolvers, and that was the American West. Though they did manage to sell uh, a significant number to the Department of the Interior to be used by tribal uh, police forces. On reservations so they had that going for them. So let's talk about the design of the Model 1875 Remington. Uh, it is very derivative of the single action Colt. There's no other way to say that. Uh, now Remington did a few things to differentiate themselves but by and large the lock work is a slightly simplified version of the Colt lock work. It loads like a Colt, it ejects like a Colt, it looks like a Colt, but it's not a Colt. Okay, so, uh, and Remington and Colt were borrowing back and forth from each other. I don't want to make it sound like Remington's a bunch of crooks, because certainly Colt abandoned the open top design for the single action army uh, without, without a hesitation. And there's very little doubt that they pirated that from the Remingtons that were their Civil War competitors uh, as just obviously having an inherently stronger frame. So Colt stole from Remington, Remington stole from Colt. That's, you know, it's not a big deal. Remington Army revolvers were single-action, six-shot revolvers. The earliest ones were chambered in 44 Remington, uh, the same as, as many of their conversion Army conversions were chambered for, which of course is a heel based 45 caliber bullet uh, fitted in a 44 caliber case. Right? So that lasted through the first variation, and, and I'm going to talk about that in just, in just a second. Yeah, I talked about the Colt and the Remington having very similar lock work and very similar mechanism overall. And that's certainly true, but there are some differences between the Colt and the Remington. Uh, for one thing, the Remington has an integral grip frame. It's, it's part of the mainframe, machined on the same bar steel. Whereas with Colt, the grip frame is a separate bolt-on assembly uh, where, where the screws can loosen, you know, you get more, more mating surfaces to worry about. With the Remington, it's just a solid grip, and that is an improved design without a doubt. Now, the Remington has an ejector, spring-loaded ejector, much like the Colt's. It mounts on the right side of the gun. It operates the same way as a Colt. <clears throat> but whereas the Colt's housing is a cylinder that's open on the bottom, and the spring-loaded ejector rod kind of slides in that channel on the bottom, and the rod comes out and pokes things out of the cylinder, right? Well, a Remington's is much flatter, and it's basically made it up against the barrel. It's part of that assembly that has that web on it and that holds a base pin. Uh, but it's made it up against the barrel and it's very flat and the spring is open out to the side, which means it's more likely to get debris clogging it and to have, have problems with obstructions uh, than a Colt design is. But, as I said, very similar to the Colt design. As I said, the grips were integral to the frame but they also are farther back from the trigger guard 
than Colt grips and much farther back from the trigger guard than the earlier new model army cap and ball revolver or conversion revolver grips uh, because that was a little tight on the hand. So Remington took those criticisms to heart and they opened that up. They opened it up more than the Colt. It's quite roomy. Uh, even though I don't have big hands, you know, gigantic hands, they, they still fit me pretty well. But because the grip is moved farther back on the gun, it makes the gun balance differently, and Remingtons are noticeably more barrel-heavy than Colts. Now, the last figure, last feature, and the most noticeable one, <coughs> pardon me, on Remingtons uh, as opposed to Colts, is that web under the barrel. Uh, it's called the web, it's called the sail, uh, whatever. It's that triangular piece of metal that is machined as part of the recoil, uh, as part of the ejector assembly, uh, and base pin shroud. It's all, all one unit. And I think the only real purpose of that is to harken back to the shape of the loading lever in the Remington New Model Army. So it gives it a bit of brand recognition because that was something that set the New Model Army apart from other guns of its era. And I think Remington was trying to play on that, and that's why we have that web in the 1875. Now, the model 1875 was produced in three recognized variations. So the first variation of the model 1875 was made between 1874 and 1878. And they fall into a serial range, serial number range. It starts with one and ends at about 16,000. Remington's really bad with serial numbers, as, as you'll see. So the main identifying feature of the first variation of the Remington is the cap and ball style pinched post front sight, which all of these first variations are equipped with. Uh, and that makes them noteworthy. The other thing, this is harder to tell at a glance, is that all of the first variations were... Um, chambered for 44 Remington caliber. Now remember, 10,000 guns were slated to go to Egypt, right? So a lot of the first variation were those guns. The first variation also had lanyard rings as a mandatory feature. They just came with the gun. The second variation is a little bit different. That came out in 1878. Uh, so the second variation's main claim to fame is that just about all of them are chambered in 4440 or 44 Winchester Centerfire. Though some were chambered in 45 Colt as well. Uh, I've never seen one. They, they are apparently quite rare and much faked. Right? So if you've got one, better make sure you really have one. Um, but there were a few, when they were right at the end of the production run, that were made in 45 Colt. 4440, however, was certainly the most common chambering for the second variation guns. Now, one of the problems with any of these variations is when Remington did the second variation guns, they gave them a unique serial number range. They started off with one again. Right, so we got 16,000 guns that are serial numbered 1 to 16,000, plus a couple. Now we've got a gun that looks almost identical. I mean, the, I'm going to tell you the differences. Uh, but it starts off with serial number 1 again and climbs from there. Now, differences are on the second variation, besides everything being 44, or most everything being 4440, is we've got a new front sight. And, and that is just a normal... Uh, cowboy type blade front sight and it's a much better sight than uh, the pinch post sight but unfortunately as with a lot of other things on the Remington 1875 there's not a whole lot of consistency because you're going to find early examples of the second variation that do have the pinch post front sight <clears throat> but if you find the standard blade front sight, you can be sure you got a second generation. And if it's 4440 uh, or 45 Colt, it's going to be the second variation as well, particularly 45 Colt, 
because it seems like those were made in one run at the end of the production cycle. So in the second variation, they were manufactured from 1878 to 1881, 1882, somewhere in there, Rush. Um, and, and the real problem is every time uh, Remington started a new batch of single-action Army revolvers, 1875s, that batch started with serial number one. And they usually made batches in lots of a thousand. And that's why there are so many low serial number Remington 1875 armies out there. Uh, a lot of them are not really anywhere near as low as they purport to be, but they're in the second flight, third flight, fourth flight, fifth flight, sixth flight of production. And each of those flights started off with a one. Uh, so pinning down the year is much harder with a Remington than it is with a Colt. Uh, they were in production from 1881-82 until 1888 in the second variation. In 1888, we get what's often called the transitional model. Remington had gone into receivership. It was bankrupt. Uh, one of the, the principal creditors of the company was Marcellus Harley. Hartley. Marcellus Hartley. So he basically owned like half of the company. And there were a number of unfinished 1875 revolvers on hand. So he basically appropriated them, took them to his store, uh, Hartley and uh, Graham in New York City, and had the gunsmiths there, the sporting goods store, had the gunsmiths there uh, assemble the parts and in doing so, they cut the webs off of the barrels. So the transitional model has no web underneath the barrel. And they were all five and a half inch barrels. That's, that's what they had for, uh, for that model. And they were all 4440s. So that becomes a transitional model. And really, it looks almost exactly like the model 1890. So there are two fast ways of telling the difference between the uh, the Hartley and Graham transitional model 1888 and an actual 1890. And in one of them, uh, you're going to see this advertisement is incorrect because all of the model 1888 transitional revolvers have got no lanyard ring. They were made without a lanyard ring at all no facility for it. The bottom uh, of the grip frame is solid. Okay, so this picture is wrong, and the the picture where I'm showing you the bottom of the lanyard ring is right. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is they will have wood grips unless they have a fancy exotic grip like stag or ivory or something like that. Uh, they're all made with wood grips, and when we get to the 1890s, you'll see that they have hard rubber grips. Which brings us to the 1890, and, and of course this one has ivory grips. Uh, but we'll be taking a look at the hard rubber grips in just a minute. Only 2020 1890, Model 1890 revolvers were made by Remington, so it's a pretty low uh, production gun. I, I happen to have one. So that is an original 1890 Remington. Uh, it's an excellent gun. They are a little bit barrel heavy, just like the 1875s. It is exactly an 1875, except minus that web. They were made in both five and a half inch and seven and a half inch barrels, of, of which the seven and a half inch barrel was actually the most popular. Uh, I prefer the five and a half inch, and I was able to secure one of those, so I'm kind of happy about that. They were all made in 4440 caliber, and they all had a lanyard ring. Now, the first variation of the 1875 had a lanyard ring. Like I said, that first variation of the 1875, the lanyard ring was a mandatory feature. They all had them. By the second variation, they made it an option. Uh, and it was an extra cost option, and almost nobody selected it. But for some reason, for the 1890, they went back to the lanyard ring. Now, my gun does not have one uh, because I took it off. It had the stud, but no ring left when I bought it, and I just removed the stud. So, so shoot me. 
uh, it's easy enough to put a new one back on. But I suspect a lot of them had their lanyard rings removed. But they only made 2,000 and uh, 20 of them, 25. And the reason is pretty simple. This gun was way obsolete. And the market that it was competing for, Colt already had totally sewn up. So nobody was clamoring to buy a large single-action revolver in 1890. And those few who were clamoring to do that were just buying Colts. So both Smith & Wesson and Remington got out of the single-action game at about this point because it was obvious that double-action revolvers had already taken over and that they were to become the iconic revolver of the 20th century. Uh, and, like I say, you could hardly give away uh, these big frame single action army revolvers anymore if your name was not Colt. So, as I have in the other segments, let me talk now about replicas of the 1875 and 1890 uh, that are modern made and how do they stack up. So, the only person making these is Uberti. This is an 1875 replica. Uh, in, in silhouette, they are very much uh, to the appearance of the actual 19th century guns. So, you know, when you look at the shape of it, the shape is very close, excellent. Certainly uh, gives you the flavor that you want. It's in the details that these guns fall down. First of all, the frames are color case hardened, and they would not be. Uh, the originals were all blued. The only part color case hardened was the loading gate and the hammer were color case hardened, not the entire frame. So that grabs your attention immediately if you know what you're looking for. The, the other thing that's wrong is the base pin retention. I'm going to put this on half cock. The base pin retention on this gun is a cross bolt, just like it is on Colts. And then you can pull out the base pin, which runs along that whole web. Right? That is the whole thing holds a base pin going back into the cylinder. On actual Remingtons. The base, the base pin is secured by a tiny little spring right at the end of the pin. So you probably will not be able to see it. I'm going to put it up there. But there's a tiny spring on the end of that pin with a little latch that sticks out, a little, little piton as my grandfather would have said, that sticks out. And that, that is what secures this gun. So that is quite different. And actually it's quite elegant because you don't have any of these buttons sticking in and out of the frame, but you didn't need to use a screwdriver like you did on the early Colts. So in a way, very good system, bravo, I would say, bravo Remington. So they get that wrong. So those those are the two things that are most most incorrect on the 1875 and 1890s. They are the same in that regard. And then the finish. So So as I said, details are wrong, but the overall silhouette is very close. Uh so it certainly gives you the flavor of firing these Remington revolvers if you own one of those. I own several of them. I like them very much, even though they're not 100% historically correct. Well, that concludes my series on Remington Army and Navy size revolvers. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, you know, to do thumbs up, make a comment. Both of those things mess with the algorithm. 
and tricks YouTube into showing my videos to more people than I think they want to, which is good for me. Uh, and it's fun to mess with their heads, so feel free. I read every comment and I respond to all of them that I can. So you know, feel free to, to send me your comments. It helps with the algorithm, but I also I kind of enjoy it. So I enjoy interacting with you. And I hope you like that too. If you're not a subscriber, by all means subscribe. And uh, to everybody, I'll see you again next week. So bye.